Good morning. Uh, we're here to worship together. Uh, this is my wife, Angie. My name's Casey. Um, we believe that the songs we sing are more than just nice things we say about God. We believe they're a place that we go to meet with God. We believe that God actually inhabits this time and these, these simple songs and simple melodies, and uh, they become a vehicle by which we connect our hearts to His. So uh, let's pray and just invite the Lord's presence into this time, and then let's um, lift our hearts in song and in faith, because um, we know that He comes when we do that. So. Oh, Lord, we just, we're just so grateful that we don't have to walk through this life alone, that you, you're with us, you carry us, uh, you guide us, you lead us, uh, you heal us, and, um, and most of all, you love us, God. You're so good and so kind to us, and um, Lord, help us rem- Remember that and see that in our daily lives. See your daily uh, loving care and tender mercies over us every morning. So, Lord, as we sing, we just ask that you would meet us in a real way and um, let your kingdom come. In every home watching and in this place now, God, we just ask for your kingdom to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let your kingdom come among us. Let your glory show your goodness. Here on earth, God, as in heaven, there is power in your presence. Let's sing that again. Let your kingdom among us let your glory show your goodness here on earth God as in heaven there is power in your presence let your kingdom come and your will be let your kingdom come and your will be done back to the top let your king come among us let your glory show your good Here on earth, God, as in heaven, there is power in your presence. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. Oh, yeah. Let your kingdom come. And your will be done. Let's sing it again. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. And your will be done. Oh, Lord. Let your kingdom come. And your will be done. We welcome your kingdom. We welcome your kingdom. We welcome your rule and your reign. We welcome your power to come and be put on.
So let your kingdom come And your will be done Let your kingdom come And your will be done Lord, we align ourselves back with you. We say, let your kingdom come in every area of our lives and our families, our work, Lord, our money, Lord, our health, Lord, our politics, God. Let your kingdom come. be done, God. We welcome your kingdom. We welcome your rule. We welcome your power to come and be put on display. We welcome your kingdom. We welcome your rule and your reign. We welcome your power. To come and be put on display. So let your kingdom come. And your will be done. Oh Lord, let your kingdom come. Like you taught us to pray, your will be done. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship. Sing it again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship. darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
You are here. You are here. Touching every heart. Touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Healing every heart. Healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Mending every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, waymaker. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, it's who you are, that is who you are, yeah, that is who you are. That is who you are. Who you are. Who you are. Show us who you are, God. Not just words, but life lived out. would know that we know that you're good you make a way God. even when we don't see it you'll work even when we don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when we don't see it you'll work even when we don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Even when, even when we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. It's who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you
were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high, hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ, what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Jesus, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. We find ourselves clothed in the powerful name of Jesus. Let us find ourselves found in your name, O oh Lord. Name's a strong tower, it's a strong tower, it's a safe refuge, it's a firm foundation. We trust the name of Jesus fresh today. Trust the name of Jesus, trust your name.
Lord, on, on this day, Lord, let us be found in you. Let us place our hope in you afresh today. Our trust. We relax our grip today, Lord. We, we let go. We let you carry us, Lord. We don't want to do this thing in our own strength, Lord. We want to be led by your spirit and be found in your name. So thank you for meeting us like you do. And let hope rise up in our hearts, God, that you're not done with us. There's a hope and a future for us. Lead us, God. Lead us, God. Amen. The Ranch Church actually got its name because we started in a barn and it just stuck. Uh, and we thought we'd always be in a barn. And uh, then we went through a journey of a number of facilities and a little bit of a decade or so at Los Olivos Elementary School. And through all of that, you, we wonder, you know, what does God really have for us? And so it is with my great pleasure for me to announce that the Ranch Church has actually purchased Shoestring Winery. Sean Craig, his father and stepmother came to Shoestring Winery from the East Coast. The reason why it's called Shoestring Winery is because they did this on a shoestring budget. It had been their life dream and they simply worked hard as middle class folks to uh, begin to you know, have some resources to do something that they were really dreaming. But they also dedicated it to every working class family that maybe could never enjoy the high net worth of certain kind of wineries. This was dedicated to working class people who live on a shoestring budget so that you could come without a cover charge and enjoy the grounds and have a picnic. And if you'd be good enough to buy a glass of wine or a bottle from them to help fund it, then you can do that as well. So uh, it was really with that heart of generosity. And I think that's what you feel here spiritually as you look around this place. So this is 60 acres. It is a working farm and it is a working winery. Today you can know that we opened escrow, we close in early September, and uh, that this is actually now coming into the kingdom of God, dedicated for the evangelistic purposes of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and as a testimony to the nations that when you think that God maybe has forgotten you, he has not. Hello, it's so nice to be with you today. My name is Mike Weiser, and I am currently serving here at the Ranch Church on the Board of Elders. And it is a privilege that Pastor Rick had asked me to uh, fill in for him today, as he couldn't be here. And as uh, Pastor Rick and Pastor Jeff Clay last week uh, have been doing, they have been taking us through the book of 2 Timothy and uh, we are still in 2 Timothy chapter 1. So if you would like to, would you just open up your Bibles now to the book of 2 Timothy? And we'll be continuing on in chapter 1. And we'll be going through verses 8 through 12. Now, verse 8 has a therefore. And whenever we start with a therefore, we have to find out what it's there for. So we'll have to go back a couple verses into what Pastor Jeff taught us last week in verses 6 and 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. And it reads like this, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And Lord, that's what we pray right now. This is what we need for this day in this age. Lord, give us this spirit that is of power and of love and of a sound mind because our country seems to, to have has lost its mind as we just see what's happening today. So, Father, I pray for the sanity of our country. 
I pray that your love and your power would come through this message for me this morning as we study through this section of Scripture. And Father, I pray that through the power of your word, our lives can be changed as you bring us calm and comfort in such a time as this. And wow, as I as just daily, I'm just I just am just amazed that's what's happening in our country. So Father, give us calm and give us sanity as we go through this time. But what Paul wanted to do for Timothy here was to remind him of some things because as as uh, Pastor Rick and Pastor Jeff has so eloquently put, this is Paul's swan song, so to, so to speak. It is his last message on earth as he has been given a death sentence by, by Caesar Nero. The last hearing that he had been through in his trial in front, of, in front of the magistrate of Rome did not go well, and he was sentenced to death. So from his prison cell, he penned down his last thoughts. And through all of Paul's writing, you will see this is a culmination of the things that he sees as the most important and as the most important things that he wants to pass on to Timothy, his young protege. Timothy, no doubt, came to Christ through the ministry of Paul. As Paul had, was, had a close relationship with this family, as we saw in the early parts of this chapter, through his, his, uh, his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. And Paul wanted to remind him that he has been given a gift of God. So he gives this phrase in verse 6, I want you to stir this up. I want you to stir up the gift of God. Now this phrase, stir up, okay, is, it comes from stoking a fire. So before you add fresh wood to a fire, you stir up the embers. And this is what he wanted Timothy to do, is to, is to stir up these embers. Don't let them die out. God has given you a gift. And, and we laid hands on you to affirm this gift that God has given you. And, and, and when you stoke this fire, remember that this fearful time you live in, because, because if you think we live in a fearful time, it is not even comparable to being a Christian during the reign of Caesar Nero. It's awful, awful, awful time to stand up for your faith because many times to be caught worshiping Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior at that time was a death sentence in itself. But Paul wanted to remind Timothy that, that this fear that welds up inside of you, this is not of God because God has given you something else. He gave you power, love, and a sound mind. So now in verse 8, as we pick it up, reading verses 8 through 12 here in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, it starts with, therefore. So now we know what that's there for. So therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and mortality and immortality to light through the gospel." To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. So, Father, send your Holy Spirit to us right now and just to give us your wisdom and your guidance as we dive in to these four verses right now. First of all, when we look at this verse 8, we we see that it begins by telling us not to be ashamed. 
not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, not to be ashamed of Paul, his prisoner, and what Paul has taught us, okay, and, and not to be ashamed of the gospel according to the power of God. Now let's talk about, first of all, let's talk about this gospel. The gospel, according to Paul in his writings, we can go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. As Paul has written in an earlier epistle, he begins by saying, Moreover, brethren, I, te- I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which, you also, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless... You believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the presence. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. So in this little synopsis, Paul basically puts a parenthesis around what his definition of the gospel is. That Christ died for our sins and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And, and how the world sees that as foolishness, foolishness, and how we are not to be ashamed by his testimony and what he had done on the cross, but to go out in power for that. Because in Romans chapter 1, we read here, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul also says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it is the righteousness of God, and it is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I am not ashamed of of the gospel of Christ. This reminds me of a time, a long time ago, I guess. It was basically in about 1988, 89. At that time, I was leading a group in a prison ministry. We were were down in Tucson. And uh, what we would do is we would form a team, a ministry team, and we would go out to the state prison. And we would be assigned a room as we would go and go and we would walk through general population, a common yard, so to speak, to where we would be assigned the cafeteria. And then the inmates would be called out on the loudspeakers. Such and such a group is now arrived, and you are now released to attend church service. It was at that particular day we were walking in, and one of the members of our ministry team uh, by the name of Jack uh, was walking beside me, and he kind of tapped me on the side of my arm there, and he said, um, I recognize somebody here. He's over there lifting weights, and, the, and you see him over there in Gen Pop? He's, he's over there. He's, he's, he's giving those, doing those curls right now, and I looked over there, and he, said, and he said, you know what? I would really like to go over there and talk to him. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, that, that um, idea, I wasn't so sure about the wisdom of that, but Jack basically didn't wait for me to say, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. He pretty much grabbed me by the shirt sleeve, and we started walking across there. The rest of the group had gone in to set up for the worship, and, and I went with Jack, and we basically walked about 50 yards to, the, to where the free weights were, and he walked up to this young man, about the same age as us. You know, we were right in our late 20s, early 30s, right in there. And he recognized him from his high school days. Jack then called out his name and proceeded to uh, say, hey, how you doing? 
his friend was surprised and pleased to see Jack. Me, personally, I kind of was gauging how fast I could run from, from the free weights back into the cafeteria where we're having church services. And, my, you know, I was, I was a little bit fearful, I have to, uh, I'll have to admit. But Jack's friend said, wow, you know, it's really nice to see you. What brings you here today? And I'll never forget these words. Jack said to this man, well, I'm born again. And I've come here today to deliver the gospel. And I got to thinking, you know, I've been a Christian for about seven, eight years now, a committed Christian for about that long a time. I have never said those words to anybody. And here was Jack standing in the middle of a prison yard or with around the freeway, so with about 15, 16 guys that were huge. And he had the boldness to say, I'm born again. And I'm here to teach the gospel. It, it was as if the world stopped. I'll never forget those words. You see, Jack was not ashamed. And then he proceeded to, to you know, talk about niceties, talk about how his family was doing, to, to kind of catch up on what you've been doing. And, and obviously, this young man didn't really want to tell Jack everything, uh, but he's was going to spend some time in, in, you know, the state prison there in Arizona. But Jack then proceeded to invite him to come over, just come across the yard and come into the cafeteria. We we're going to, you know, conduct a uh, church service, and you're free to come. And we just turned around, and we just started walking back. And uh, I wanted to run. Jack was calmly walking back. And as I looked across my shoulder back to the, where the free weights were, I saw these men kind of grouped together and to begin to discuss what had just happened. And we went in and we proceeded to finish, help, finish set up for our church service, the instruments, the, you know, the keyboard, the guitars, and, and to uh, get ready for the, the inmates to come in as they started to file in from all over the prison yard. It just warmed my heart to see Jack's friend come in with a couple more of those guys who were at the prison yard. You see, Jack wasn't ashamed, and that had an effect on those men that day. And like I said, I would, I'll never forget that. And to this day, I've never, I've, I've, I've never been afraid to tell somebody I've been born again when they ask what I've been doing with my life. Moreover, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, our Lord Jesus had more to say on this subject of being ashamed. We find that, that, that Jesus had, kind of, had called his people to himself, along with his disciples, all the people that were, happened to gather around him, and he called them to step in. He called them in. In verse 34 of chapter 8, it says this, when he had called the people to himself and his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and of the gospels will save it. Can I read that again? But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it? For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, and in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in the glory of his Father and of his holy angels. The first time that I read that, that had that same impact upon me. I'll never forget these scriptures. It reminds me of another time when a young mother who had been attending our Bible studies, in, also in Tucson, had been, had been you know, newly to the faith. She had been new to the faith. She had recently accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior. And along with her, her teenage daughter, 
But her teenage daughter was, had been going through some hard times because the four months that followed her decision to live for Christ were, were, were a time of great tumult for her. And she found herself ashamed, ashamed of her mom for the, for the way their lives have been changed now that they are Christians, ashamed of, of having to tell her friends that, well, yeah, I got to go to church. I can't hang with you. And, and, and my mom won't let me do this anymore. And my mom won't let me do this, do this with you anymore. And, and, and it just on and on, this and that. To the, it got so the, the mother became so exasperated that she, she, we set up a special time for her to bring her teenage daughter to our home. And her teenage daughter began to explain that, that she couldn't do this, that this was not the life for her, that she felt shame because of her decision, because of the way her friends made her feel, because of the, the way that her friends made her feel like that they've been abandoned by her, that, that, they don't, that she doesn't love them anymore. And there can be a lot of pressure for young people in the face of this. And so what did we do? We turned to this passage as the Holy Spirit led us here. And we read that passage, verse 38 of Mark chapter 8. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him or her, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and of the holy angels. And I remember reading that in the presence of that young mother and that teenage daughter and seeing both of them stiffen up because, because they had both confessed that this was the very first time they have ever read that passage. You see, we cannot be ashamed of any of this because Jesus Christ is our representative in front of God the Father. Because, we, because when we stand before God the Father on that day, when we meet him face to face, he is our advocate. He stands up for us and he says, this is my, is, this is my beloved Mike. This is my beloved Anna. This is my beloved son or daughter who they have put their trust and their faith in me. And before you, Father, they stand guiltless. And I can never be ashamed of the gospel that will do that for me in the face of everything that I have done in my whole life. And this young woman was so touched by these words that she went on to be a strong, strong Christian. And for that, we are so thankful. But it wasn't me or, or anybody else that changed this young woman it was God's word. And so we, we stand here and we deliver this gospel according to the power of God. And, and there's just two examples of, of me experiencing the power of God through these scriptures. Verse 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? Back in 2 Timothy chapter 8, verse 9. It is Jesus who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, nothing that we have done, but according to his purpose and grace, which has been given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now, the church of Ephesus is where I really want to go right now because Timothy had been asked by Paul to step into the senior pastor role in that church in Ephesus. And in Revelation chapter 2, it tells us that they would be going through a time where, where they would move into, a, into an area of having a legal relationship with our Lord Jesus instead of a loving personal relationship with our Lord Jesus. And as chap, verse 9 tells us here, that we are saved, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace. You see, so it is not our works that got us into the kingdom, and it won't be our works that refine us while we're in the kingdom. It is our relationship with God that defines us. So we do not need to be looking for this legal relationship with God when we serve him, but we need to be looking for a personal love relationship 
with our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, you see what had happened there. Hopefully not while Timothy was there, but what had happened through time that Jesus told them in, in, chapter, in verse 4 of chapter 2 of Revelation that they need to return to the first works. They have, they have lost their first love. They need to return back to their first love. So back now into 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. That Jesus has now been revealed by the peer, that that uh, that but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and mortality and light through the gospel. So it is by this appearing, by this work that Jesus Christ has done, that he has abolished death and brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. So don't gloss over this. Don't read over this. This is very significant. That, that death has been abolished and, and life and, more, and immortality have been brought to light. So what that essentially means, and hopefully you won't read this anytime soon, but if the Lord doesn't return, many of you are going to read in the paper that I've died. Don't believe that for a minute. You see, because we as Christians, we don't die. We just move into phase two. You see, death has been defeated. O oh, death, O oh, death, where is thy sting? There is no power anymore in, 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 in death. Again, a story of a, that I've heard of a, of a man driving down the, the road with his windows open and his young daughter in the passenger seat in front. And as this man was driving along, all of a sudden there was a bee in the car. And his young teenage daughter, junior high age daughter, began to really freak out because this bee was buzzing around the car. Get it out, get it out, do something with this bee because she did not want to get stung. And so the father reached out and he caught the bee. And then he went, he, and then he opened up his hands, and he let the, and he threw the bee out the window. And his daughter looked at him and he said, did, "Weren't you afraid to get in stung? Did, did that bee sting you?" And the father reached out his hand and showed him the stinger was still in the hand. And he says, "Yeah, that, that bee stung me, but I have taken that that sting for you, so that bee couldn't sting you." And that's the same picture we have of what Jesus did for us. He, O oh death, O oh death, where is thy sting? It's in Jesus' hands. He took the sting of death away. So we do not die. So when you read that about me, and if you do read that about me, don't you believe it for a second because I will not die. And neither will you if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Verse 11 goes on to say, To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So Paul, passing this on to Timothy, trying to, trying to stir up into Timothy this gift that he was called to, to encourage him, to give him, to give him this renewed sense of purpose as senior pastor in Ephesus where he was, where he was serving to, be, to understand that you will be a preacher, you will be an apostle, and you will be a teacher to the Gentiles as Paul was. And so breaking that down, preaching, as we have read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 already, in verse, verse 1, that in, starting in verse 1 and 2, we'll go in verse 2, uh, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse, verses 2, by which you are saved if you hold fast to the word which I preach to you. So preaching goes hand in hand with bringing the gospel to the lost and dying world. Preaching is for, is for, the, is for the truth of the gospel to go 
out into the world in, in the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to bring people to salvation. And then second of all, the apostleship. The apostleship is, is basically a word we're using for the leadership. As Paul, being senior pastor, he's going to have many other pastors underneath him. And, and it, is, it is basically a... It is, it is basically the, the, the natural progression of a young man or a woman to be raised up and to be sent out from the church in which they, they had been taught and to go out and to, be, and to reach others for Christ. And we see as that natural progression goes on, Paul uh, is telling Timothy here, you, you need to oversee that. You need to be the apostle for them as you disciple these people so they can go out and disciple others. And then as a teacher which is something that the church needs on a regular, daily basis. They need the sound, biblical teaching of the Word of God. Now, you can be somebody who doesn't really want to get into doctrine until you kind of understand what the word doctrine really means. The doctrine really basically means this, sound, biblical teaching. So, we want to engage in sound, biblical teaching, I believe, on a daily basis. It is something that is essential for us for our growth and for our understanding and for the ability of the Holy Spirit to work in us because as we do go through the Scriptures, we gain an understanding. And when we have that understanding, we can, we can basically uh, cause others to receive that understanding because we have that embedded in us. That's just basically part of the teaching. And so Paul is reminding Timothy, stir that up, stir that up. Now, verse 12 goes on to say this. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. And of course he's talking about Jesus Christ. You see, I'm so glad he didn't say, for I know what I have believed, but he says, I know whom I have believed. Because it is all about Jesus here. It is about what he has done. So Paul is saying, look, I'm about, I'm, I suffer now. I've suffered for a long time for the cross, and I am not ashamed of that. In fact, I... I find it a tremendous privilege to suffer for the cross, to suffer for salvation, to suffer for the gospel. And now I'm going to be going to my death because of this gospel, because of this testimony that of Jesus. So I know whom I have believed, but I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. And, and Paul in a very short while, he is going to be face to face with Jesus. And he knows that Jesus will keep him just as he has kept him all along. See, that is our stance. That is our faith. That is, that is our glory because it's, it is his glory. Because we can, we can live this now. We can affect lives now. Because we know that to be absent from this body is to be, to be present with the Lord. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, that we have this a building of God that is going to be prepared for us. Because right now we live in a tent. It's kind of like when we go camping. You know, it's kind of fun for a while, but if we have to sleep on the ground every day in this tent, and then pretty soon, you know, through all the changings of the seasons, this tent begins to break down and start, it's got holes in it, and it's not very fun to sleep on the ground in a tent for your whole life. But that's kind of the analogy that Paul gives us as we live our lives in this body. But prepared for us is a building of God that we will be clothed with a new body, which is from heaven. For we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are absent from the Lord. But we would choose rather to be absent from these bodies 
Because when we are absent from these bodies, we will be present with the Lord. And that is our hope. And that is our calling. And that is our gospel. So, we, so be very cheerful that you have eternal life. Be very glad that you have something of value that we can share. Because as we look around once again and we see our lives as, as, as the new normal, right? The old normal is gone. We, we don't know if that's ever coming back. But now we have this new normal, this, this COVID-19 experience that we're living in, this, this time of protest where, where it seems, again, that, that w- can we just find some sanity in this world anymore? Yes, we can, right here in the Word of God. I thank you for your time. I thank you for giving me your attention for this teaching. And once again, I just would like to bring our salvation right in front of God right now and thank him with all of our hearts. Because if it wasn't for what he has done on the cross. If it wasn't for his grace, none of us could experience this salvation which will lead us to eternal life. Thank you and have a great week in the Lord. 